So it's my pleasure to welcome you to another uh, season, if I can put it that way, uh, or uh, academic year of uh, Wallace Stegner Center programs, both our Green Bag series and uh, our lecture series, as well as our annual uh, symposium. Uh, I'm Bob Keiter. Uh, I've returned to the proverbial saddle after a year sabbatical uh, to uh, uh, continue directing the Wallace Stegner Center here at the uh, S.J. Quinney College of Law, and uh, let me welcome you. And uh, let me, uh, before we get uh, going with uh, today's program, let me just uh, announce a couple of our uh, upcoming events. On uh, uh, right here over the noon hour, uh, we will have uh, Brenda Bowen, uh, who's director of the Global Change uh, and Sustainability Center here. Uh, at the university, also an associate professor in geology and geophysics, uh, who will speak uh, about her research on uh, the dynamics of the changing Bonneville salt flats. Uh, most of you are aware that uh, this has been an issue that's garnered a good deal of public attention as to what's happening with the salt flats. Uh, she'll share the results of uh, her research to date. Uh, on October 11th, uh, the Stegner Center has the pleasure of co-sponsoring with uh, the American West Center and the J. Willard Marriott Library and the Utah State Historical Society, a program uh, entitled Navajo Voices on Bears Ears uh, that's scheduled for that evening uh, between 7 and 9 p.m. Uh, here in the uh, Moot Court uh, room. And it will uh, include a number of uh, uh, Navajo speakers uh, from uh, such universities as uh, New York University, uh, Dartmouth College, uh, Utah State University, uh, and the programs being organized and moderated by uh, Professor Farina King from Northeastern State University in Oklahoma. Uh, also on the program is uh, an attorney from the Department of Justice with the Navajo Nation. Again, that's uh, October 11th uh, in the evening here. Uh, on uh, November 1st, uh, over the noon hour, our uh, Stegner Center Young Scholar Lecture is scheduled, and that's on the subject of clean energy equity, uh, and it's being given this year by Associate Professor of Law Felix Mormon from Texas A&M University School of Law, who's also a, uh, a fellow at uh, Stanford uh, Law School. And then I'd uh, be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, in the middle of March, March 15th and 16th, uh, we uh, will be holding our uh, annual uh, symposium, actually the 23rd uh, annual Stegner Center Symposium. Uh, and this year the topic is public lands in a changing west, which seemed like an appropriate topic given uh, all of the issues regarding public lands that have been in the news recently. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet that uh, I think is uh, going around or will be circulated and uh, 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 please uh, sign up so we can keep track of attendance and uh, uh, be sure to have uh, contact information so you're uh, on our list to get information about future events. Uh, the King's English Bookshop, as most of you noticed, has sales of uh, uh, Greg Meehan's book uh, available and he'll be signing them uh, afterwards uh, out in the uh, lobby area. Uh, that said, let me uh, proceed to introduce uh, our speaker uh, today who's a uh, Gregory Meehan, who has held uh, worldwide executive leadership roles in a large multinational corporation involved in strategically assessing new market opportunities to bring faster, better health care in both first and third world uh, settings. Uh, in his uh, capacity as product planning head, uh, Greg was responsible for anticipating new market opportunities that were unlocked by technological convergence. In his new book, uh, Greg uh, draws upon uh, this international experience, his strategic business planning knowledge, his engineering training, and his global business skills to envision a credible and eminently achievable path forward to end uh, our reliance on fossil fuels and to embrace the opportunities that the renewable energy field uh, offers us. Uh, his uh, basic uh, thesis is that uh, our uh, massive dependence on fossil fuels must necessarily run its course. 
uh, not because uh, petroleum stocks will be depleted, but because more attractive alternatives will emerge, uh, disrupting and ultimately replacing uh, the petroleum dependence. Uh, so he will be examining uh, today, as he does in his book, uh, when and how uh, our world's reliance on fossil fuels uh, naturally changes. With that, uh, let me introduce and please welcome uh, Greg Meehan. Let me get turned on here. Trying to find a button. Is this working? Hello? Yeah. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I want to thank the Stegner Center, Bob, and um, University of Utah Press. And I was thinking about this. It was um, four I think it was about four years ago at, at the library, I attended the Stegner Center Symposium on National Parks. And uh, I had uh, met Kate Cannon, who was the superintendent for southeastern uh, parks in, uh, in uh, Utah here. And I did a, a, a volunteer stint. And uh, I'm not sure how helpful I was to, to Kate, but it, it was amazing um, kind of getting away from things, the everyday uh, work. And in Moab, you've got the uranium tailings. Uh, you've got the convergence of the Green River and the Colorado River. You've got all kinds of energy sources. You've got some of the largest producing petroleum fields in the lower 48 states nearby. So, you know, it begged the question, you know, how are these energy forces vying and what is the you know, what does the near-term future look like? And, and that became just really the puzzlings that became the book. I, I didn't set out to write a book per se, but as I dove in, uh, it got deeper and deeper. And, uh, and I decided somewhere along the line, let me see if I can share this. So today, I, I'd like to kind of spend an hour <laughs> distilling down really two years of head down research and writing. And I'll start with an executive summary. I believe by the end of this century, and it's not wishful thinking, I believe with every instinct in my bone, that, that where fossil fuels today are 85% of the world's global primary energy, it will be less than 20% by the end of this century. And I believe most of that will be related to the use of petroleum and natural gas as chemical feedstocks, but even there, there are new entrants that, that are emerging and, and, and new opportunities. So I, I won't talk about the feedstock side of this. I'm going to talk about the energetic side of it. I also believe, and I'll discuss it in a moment, there are four broad category of forces that are bearing down on the continued use of fossil fuels. And they're not everywhere the same. We sit here in the U.S. and, and the collective force across those categories is one thing you can you can go to India, you can go to Western Europe, and those forces are different. And so we'll see a different pace of change. And I'll also say, with a little bit of worry, that the early movers will have an advantage in staking out commercial positions. And, and uh, I think the U.S. Is in, a, is in a measured approach, and that certainly doesn't uh, lend itself to uh, global leadership, if you will. So. That's my introduction, executive summary. What I'd like to do is now maybe start off with, uh, is that slide up here? There it is. You know, a simple notion of life cycle. I believe that everything, markets, incumbents, product leaders and product categories, they're all subject to life cycles. Markets don't stand still for very long, and that's true of the energy field as well. And what's interesting is you'll see down at the bottom, um, maybe that where a, a linear growth curve for a, a new entrant is, has taken place for the last 10 years, but now it's, it's poised and ready to see an exponential growth curve. So you, you think about often we say, Things happen a lot slower than we expect, and when they happen, they happen a lot faster, and it's generally because you see a, a life cycle. And those introductory, those disruptive technologies spend years refining their cost position, uh, refining their, their value proposition to the customers, and then suddenly when they have that package right, they hit a tipping point, and it doesn't happen in linear terms. It happens very, very fast. And I know personal experience. Um, going after markets, 
study in markets where fundamentally what that market technology has converged, what customers want in value changes. You can see that converging and, and incumbents sometimes miss this. So, sometimes it happens and completely new companies come into the marketplace, establish leader position, and years later, the market incumbent is almost saying, what happened? And same, uh, when you see at the top, you see the, the inflection points. When something is taking off, typically that means something is, is seeing a decline. Uh, and, and I think this is an important um, little notion to agree with. And when you think of the energy field as today, I think the progress appears to be very, very slow. But when you look at it globally, and you look at those forces, and you believe that there are trigger points that where you will see rapid change, I think we're moving very closely to those trigger points, and in some markets we're already seeing that. Okay? And, and I guess the last thing that, that I'll say as I move on from this, but I'll refer back to this often, is, is in, the, in the case of, of fossil fuels, you'll see like Florida Power formed a company called NextEra. And they, they do renewable projects around the country. So kind of they, they're standing in two places, but they do. They have had the ability to peer into the future and they're positioning their organization to straddle this transition. Other companies may have spent time discounting the disruptive technologies and I think it's gonna be a difficult um, uh, period ahead for them. All right, so with that as a backdrop, I, if, if one is skeptical I, I go back to this uh, notion of things move very, very fast. You, you think about the personal transportation. It is amazing to think that just 100 years later, after person, affordable personal transportation, we've got a billion cars on the road. Um, if you think about it, just recently I was driving by the Kitty Hawk, and I'm thinking it wasn't that long ago when Wilbur was you know, pushing off. And here we are landing on comets, and we've changed the way we move around the globe. And we think about our... It wasn't that long ago, frankly, when you have Tesla and Edison kind of debating what's the grid, what's the, the, the standard of the grid, and we've electrified the world. Electricity has become ubiquitous, except for a billion people, but we'll get to that in a, a little bit. And think about South Florida without electricity for weeks on end. It really, it's become fundamental, but how fast has it changed? And I'd say, I think about that in this, this marketplace. It gives me reason to be happy energy field is no different and it may look like it's moving slow but it'll move quickly so um, what I did want to do maybe answer very quickly and I'm not going to get into the specifics but one may ask do renewables really have the potential to replace fossil fuels do we really have a choice and the answer is the answer is loud and clear on the left you see renewables are power sources right they're perpetual we harvest energy from these power sources Practical, and I use the term practical because there's many impractical places to harvest renewables, but practical locations to harvest renewables, there's more than 200 terawatts of solar alone. And you see that little circle over there? That is the projected worldwide demand for energy in 2040. So if you think renewables don't have the potential to replace fossil fuels, these are practical potentials. Solar by far, wind is, is very important as well. But where geothermal, hydro, and some of the tidal, where these are evident from the delivered by nature, if you will, they're potent and uh, wonderful sources. So that's about the answering the question, do renewables? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's also important to kind of get an eye around, we see a lot of news around the power sector, and you say, well, geez, power sector is just one piece of the puzzle, right? Do renew how, how can renewables help us in industrial heating applications? How can renewables help us in, in chemical feedstocks? So on the left, you see our current, this is US baseline. You see our sources of energy dominated by petroleum and natural gas and, and coal. Renewables there primarily are used for our, our uh, ethanol and our large hydro and then our nuclear. So that's the US baseline. And you can see the sectors that they serve. And the point is, as we move through the 21st century, how do we replace, what are the challenges and obstacles to replacing fossil fuels across all of those sectors that you see? 
you, you're seeing loud and clear the electric power sector. We've got many of the renewables and I call complementary technologies that are going to help us in the power sector, and we're going to continue to see that march. You see many states implementing renewable portfolio standards, and that's going to continue that march. You're seeing increasingly, it's just amazing, just the last six months announcements out of the transportation sector. Um, countries uh, putting a goal to ban the, the, uh, the sale of in, internal combustion engines. You're seeing auto manufacturers announcing discontinuance of the internal combustion engine. So signals are pretty loud that both the power and the transportation sectors are going to seek and find alternatives. And there's, I'll get to the forces in a moment. The stickier application will be heat generation. And I think in the back half of this century, we'll, we will see the emergence of a new age fuel, likely hydrogen. And then finally, uh, I, I can't uh, spend enough time on this, so I won't touch it. But in terms of feedstocks, it, it, you know, I'll talk a little bit about plastics. You know, 8% of worldwide petroleum is, it goes into the production of plastics and both the material and the energetic. Um, um, uh, energy to, to generate those plastics, and, and yet in the U.S. our recycle rate is is well less than 10% in our municipal solid way. So I think there's two things that are going to happen there. We're going to learn how to. We're going to force ourselves if we're interested in sustainability models to learn how to recycle and use those resources more effectively. But I I, I will also tell you that we're seeing increasingly biosources for those hydrocarbons. So uh, even though feedstocks may be the last segment standing, if you will, for fossil fuels, there are disruptive technologies in there as well. All right, so that, with this as a backdrop, I wanted to kind of state conclusion and move on. We are turning the page on, on fossil fuels. And, and I do maybe, when I use the title, thank you fossil fuel, a, it may sell, sound flippant, but I really don't mean it flippantly. I really do believe that uh, we've been fortunate in many ways to have such amazing supplies of fossil fuels, and they've allowed us to do amazing things in our development. And, but they've always been a transient source of energy. It's maybe the question is not you know, whether they're transient. We can probably all agree to that. The question is, when do we need to move on? And I'm saying that this is the century where we move on. Now, I want to introduce something that I think is very helpful. And if you're interested in policy, and this is the way I think you, you look at markets and you say, geez, what are the mar major forces that are at play in those markets? And, and I put the, the petroleum um, drop in the middle to say more significantly, what are the forces that are bearing down on the uh, continued use of uh, fossil fuels, and, I, and I'm looking at this graphic, and I'm thankful that I, I never uh, pursued a career as an inventor, because I'm not sure a four-way vice grip would work. But um, So I, I think of, of maybe you've got the, the, the vertical, you've got uh, increasing marginal costs of, of fossil fuels. As you look at the application of, of technology in the production of fossil fuels, they're they've these, this is, we've been at this 150 years. Our cost positions are we're very efficient in our costs, but we continue to employ in more and more technology to harvest those reserves. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. There, there can be no doubt when you look at the curves on the costs of harvesting renewable energies, I'll look at the, just the electric car batteries. It was Five years ago, it's $1,000 per kilowatt hour. We're approaching $100 per kilowatt hour for a car battery. These markets are changing. Those prices are fall that we're scaling up, and these, these renewables are not something that you think about in terms of subsidy anymore. I need to subsidize this to make this. These are standing there on their own two feet. And then I think the, the, uh, the third force that I, I believe after reading over 50 energy plans from around the world, a common theme in every country's desire is energy independence. We see it in the U.S. And it's a strong part of how we drive our energy policy. But everywhere in the world wants that. And the moment, and I call it a big late, and this is the one that I think is going to move the curve very, very quickly, is the moment countries that are dependent upon importing fossil fuels, the moment they can 
gather those staples, energy staples domestically, they're going to move very, very quickly, and we're starting to see that around the world. It won't be the U.S., but there are many places around the world where that tipping point is there. And then whether or not uh, the last category, I call it environmental and health, go back 150 years, the evidence of uh, negative environmental and health consequences of setting fossil fuels afire has been mounting, and that will continue to be a repressive force. That is not a force that's going to dissipate and go away. That's a force that's only going to increase. So these are the four categories that I think you, you look at them and you go, and you say, why is one country moving fast and another country moving, not moving at all? Why is one country moving in a measure? I would say if you, you went ab about measuring these, you would have countries like the U.S. that have supplies of fossil fuels that are economical, that they can harvest. You have places where we have energy independence. I think in the U.S. we have, believe it or not, at least for now, we have pretty strong environmental and health, and that's continuing to move up. But we don't have that force we have choice. Um, and maybe, maybe that's the, the, uh, the difficulty with choice. It, it delays our realization of that tipping point here in the U.S. So every country is different, and I think it's useful to look at this framework when you try to understand what's going on. Um, I do want to have a caveat, because in talking about energy with folks, you have to, a coal plant, you can locate a coal plant really anywhere location-wise, and it's going to it's going to generate electricity with a certain efficiency. But enthusiasm for renewable energies alone does not overcome putting a wind turbine or a solar panel in a poor location. Nature kind of tells us where we can harvest energy and where it makes sense to harvest solar. If you look on the left, it's an interesting, these are uh, uh, maps from NASA that show the average wind speed at 50 meters. Right? We know these turbines are higher than that now. But you can see at the 40, roughly the latitudes 40 and above in, in, the, in the north and the south, you see some pretty good wind. You see wind offshore is very potent. You see, look at the U.S., the interior of the U.S. And you'll find that uh, when we're placing wind turbines in that location, they're pretty productive in terms of their cost per kilowatt hour they generate. But you can place that same turbine um, over there in, in Georgia, and it, it's going to be less cost effective by far. So it's important that, to know where there are fertile locations from which to harvest um, uh, uh, renewables. But also, and then on the right you look at it, and, and uh, you can see obviously in the lower latitudes, that's where the solar insulation is the greatest, and you have the least seasonal variation. But I also like to point out uh, that nature's thrown us a little bit of bone here. Uh, in that solar and wind tend to complement each other. When you look at them, you can see where kind of solar starts to fade away in terms of its, its uh, energy uh, per location per year. You're starting to see wind is picking up, and, and that's evident. And Germany mentions that often they, they're harvesting solar up in the North Sea, and their solar investments are in the south of, of Germany, and together um, uh, they're... Uh, quite effective. So that's a backdrop. So when someone says, geez, I, I, I rolled by a turbine that seems like 200 days a year, it's sitting quiet, well, then I, I would say, I would argue that, that that's a poorly located wind turbine, right? Um, uh, I do want to maybe uh, make a comment about reserves. Uh, for, for decades, the forward supplies of fossil fuels have maintained about a 50-year forward supply globally. And, I, and you'd say, well, geez, you know, is this a, th if you believe, uh, you know, physical quant quantities are important, you say, well, what's to stop that from happening? And I would say they've been able to do that in the past through advancing technology. They're able to go after different types of reserves and more efficiently uh, pull reserves uh, from the ground. They've been able to do that through access and globalization of the industry has opened up the world to that. But I, I think what's happened now, and it's like a shadow that's moved through the room, I think economics is being promoted as a bigger determinant of what reserves really are. It's no longer, in my mind, a question of what's technologically recoverable. 
uh, now you're in a competitive marketplace. It's what's economically recoverable. And I think the world's value is changing such that I think reserves may be overstated in many cases. All right, so um, my main point there is fossil fuels, the marginal costs of fossil fuels are going one direction, renewables are going another direction. You've got feet in the sand going two different directions. And uh, so I, I'm not going to um, get in great detail, but I want to show you a slide from U.S. unsubsidized, levelized costs in the power sector. And I guess the first observation there is, geez, we've got a lot of sources of energies we can tap into. Second, if you look to the left, you see that the um, combined cycle uh, gas is, is very, very um, cost effective. But you can also see solar PV utility and onshore wind as superior from a cost position. Um, you also see something that's going to change is see our gas peaking plant. We have a power grid that is built upon, really it's a demand oriented grid. Uh, we still have 38,000 folks out there reading uh, meters manually. So it's not a smart grid. And I think what you're going to, and it, there's a high cost of delivering peak power. And, and so you can see that gas peaking plants. And I think what you're going to see in the future is smarter grids, smarter devices that integrate. And when we have um, supplies, smart devices are going to use those resources and then they'll defer applications when we're not running them. So. Uh, th that will certainly help when we're dealing with temporal uh, renewables, all right? So um, I, I did want to come back to, to this just briefly to say that um, you know, I was looking at this environmental um, side of this. You know, we, we, we're, we're certainly increasingly concerned globally, individually it may vary, but globally it's, it's rat ratcheting up our concern with our CO2 emissions. And I see a lot of uh, uh, funding out of the DOE for carbon capture. Uh, you see that around the world. But there's a common theme. It's always out there. And, you know, it's 2020s. It's 2030s. And you go, ah. And then I, I uh, maybe some of you are aware of it. Right up north of us is, is uh, uh, the Boundary Dam car, uh, Coal Power Plant in Saskatchewan, right? And I, I read that it's got a... Uh, captures carbon at 90% of CO2 emissions are captured from the coal power plant. I go, wow, that's very good. And then I uh, read on how they justified it. They sold the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery and had a 60 kilometer pipeline. I go, dad, nab it. You know, so, but it does reveal, maybe for policy folks, the hierarchy of the US and many parts of the world economics over the environment. We talk, to, we talk about it. But a couple more cents per kilowatt hour, mm, nah, we don't want to do it. So, you know, I, I believe when you think about policy, if, if we want to stop talking about carbon capture and sequestration as a potential R&D, put a price tag out and that'll bring that technology forward or not, right? But I, I think as we are, we are uh, deferring action, if you will. So, um, so there's the boundary dam. And uh, so I, I kind of, Say, all right, if you, if you think about those four forces, every day there's signals whipping by. And I'm hoping what the book does is, is uh, give a baseline to those that read it that says, how do I interpret these signals? Because well, headlines have me going in different directions. You know, the same, same publication can have an article saying climate change isn't important or it's changing the rotation of the planet. Um, and so... You don't know what to do. So when I think of it, there's signposts that are whipping by, and I, I let me just go th through them very briefly. When you, the terminology that's almost, we're all familiar with it, we talk about different types of reserves that have been difficult, oil sands, tight oil, tight gas. We talk about horizontal drilling. We talk about fracturing. We talk about technologies to do um, more economical offshore uh, drilling. So, you know, the vocabulary has changed, which then is, gives us, you know, the, the implication of that, it takes us to the second signal, is that projects, you know, when we think about the price of, of our fossil fuels, they, they really represent a basket of projects. And some of them, you know, $20, $25, $35 are the, are the cost of recovering these. But the cost is a basket of projects, but the projects are incrementally moving up. And what we're seeing also is that at the, the fields, the, the decline from year one production is, is 
is, uh, is higher than it's ever been. And continue. so we're, we're tapping more and more difficult and the return on investment is going down the project. So we have increasing marginal costs. And also uh, look at this oversupply with our, our oil sitting at $50 for how long? And we were all very surprised when you saw it bump up to 100 and 130. Who would have thought it would go down to 50? And I, you take the perspective of looking at these signals, and we're not the only ones looking at these signals. If you're an oil producer, you can have one of two outlooks. You can say, I see disruptive technology. I'm going to pump while I can to avoid loss asset. Or I discount those, those uh, disruptive technologies, and I'll pump in a metered way to maximize my um, uh, profitability over a longer horizon. And I think what we're seeing now is, particularly in the petroleum, uh, there's a lot of folks with, that are in a position to export petroleum, and it's difficult hurting those cats. And I think they're going to pump all they can. So I think we're in a sustained period of low pricing. And if the pricing did go up, that will only speed the tipping point to renewables. So they're caught between, they're almost like they're competing against um, other suppliers of fossil fuels. And they're, they're low cost in a mature market, you, you manage your costs down. And the, those folks that are most successful have the lowest cost. So those countries that are sitting on low cost assets are going to take advantage of that asset. They're going to hold the cost down and they're also going to defer the realization of renewables market by market. But it'll only be a deferral. It won't last forever. Saudi Arabia may be the, last, uh, the fourth point. I think of them as the epicenter of petroleum and, and their current energy uh, po po um, program has a 40% of their power sector moving over to um, alternatives nuclear and renewables um, by 2040. And they're looking into actually then ramping that up and seeing if they can have generate electricity and export that through a multinational um, uh, grid. So that's a clear signal. Uh, if Saudi Arabia sees the future, um, uh, others uh, would be wise to do as uh, I've already talked about the emergence of cost competitive alternatives. I think the the technologies to harvest uh, renewables are there. I think what's going to also help is the complementary technologies that, that will help that as well. So, um, and then I believe uh, more and more, you look at, uh, as I come through the door here, this is a sustainable uh, building. Many, many uh, folks are, are interested and consumers are interested in doing business with folks with sustainable, sustainable business models. And I, and I think that Fossil fuels depleted upon use are incompatible with that, while as renewables that are perpetual um, are more consistent with that outlook. And then I think our um, environmental custodianship and the mounted evidence is going to be placing a, a higher value on clean, te clean energy, and that's also um, uh, evident in the, one of the four signals. So there's the signals. Now what I, I thought, uh, I want to pivot a little bit and, and maybe run around the globe and uh, as I said, I, I had looked at uh, 50 energy uh, plans, and, and I was like, geez, everybody's in a different place. And I had to, by the way, I would say this to you, and you almost have to suspend your own personal belief when you see policy, because it may or may not line up with what you're thinking. But there are these, these, these forces, if you can separate your, yourself, I'll kind of give you a context. This also, this framework, and I'll describe it down at the bottom, I call it the fossil fuel wealth factor. And what I've done is I've added up that country's um, reserves of fossil fuels, all three of them, and I've put it in, in common terms, uh, heat content. And I, do, I normalized it globally. Uh, and uh, so if someone has a fossil fuel wealth factor of one, that means they have their fair share, right? So above one, you've got more than your share of fossil fuel reserves, less than one, um, uh, you've got less. Same thing, uh, primary, I, I wanted to say, geez, how much of a consumer of energy are you? What's your primary energy consumption? So I've done the same thing. I added up across the energy sectors, how much a, uh, a country consumes of, of primary energy, normalized that on a per capita basis. And I just, I plotted it for 230 countries and I've given you a little sampling. But it helped me get a sense of what their maybe they uh, anticipate what their policy or interpret their policy, if you will. And what you'll see 
is, and I think this is who, you to watch, who to watch for what. I think when you look at the vulnerable, through the lens of fossil fuel resources, the last 150 years, if you've been an importing country, you've been vulnerable, right, to supplies. There's been political angles to supplies. There's been disruptions. Uh, some of us know about the OPEC many years ago. Um, so you see over there, you see countries like South Korea, Japan, Italy, Spain, China um, are in the, in the vulnerable category. And I would say Germany, now the fortunate countries, these are countries that have more than their share. And, and this is where you'll see many of the exporters, Saudi Arabia, Russia, uh, Canada, Norway. Um, <clears throat> Germany, almost all of their um, uh, fossil fuels was uh, um, uh, uh, the lignite coal. So to, you could actually argue, um, maybe I shouldn't have counted that, and which brings them into the vulnerable category. And then you have countries such as India um, and Brazil uh, that are doing two things. They would be looking for, for development uh, as well as their energy staples. And then there's very few countries that I call them the unactualized, where they've been fortunate over the last 150 years to have, have a lot of reserves, but they've been, not been able to translate that in, into development. And <clears throat> I also point out when you look at it, and this goes back to the tipping point, it's amazing that over 200 countries out of 230 have very few fossil fuel. They're dependent upon importation. Um, and it's very different than if, if, that was, if that was the U.S., we would be acting very differently. So we're, we're, we're over there on this group of 30. So there's 200 countries out there that are looking at this new renewable technologies and how those costs are coming down and they're, they're economically modeling this out and looking for that tipping point when, geez, let's run at this and let's run at it hard. Um, so it's not surprising when you looked at it. I, when I looked at it here, let me tell you, when I first looked at this, you see, you know, U.S. You know, leads the world in installation of, of certain renewables, but when you put it on a per capita basis, it was pretty anemic. You know, so if you, if you looked at the implementation of, of renewables on a capacity per capita, what emerged was it, it all came out of these vulnerable countries. These are the countries that, that this is. And now if you look at this framework, not through the lens of fossil fuels, but through the lens of renewables, I would say the vulnerable are the fortunate and the fortunate are the vulnerable. If you, if you have a, if you have a, take Norway, 30% of their government revenues are dependent upon the taxation from their energy. 30%. They're going to have to find ways to refashion their economy. Uh, they've set aside an $860 billion fund, $170,000 per person. In Norway, they see the future and they're going to have to retrain as they peer into the future. So. Uh, I think Norway's out in front of it, and it'll be interesting to follow how that fund, um, how successful that fund is in retraining and finding other commercial opportunities. But <clears throat> they're smart to do that. So, um, so I, I do want to, uh, you know, obviously we all talk to friends about this subject, and sometimes it becomes very polarizing, and, and I find those discussions, sometimes they're, they're not very helpful. Um, but I, I do think you have to have a little bit of a uh, uh, sense that we, we tend to uh, uh, have objections to every project. Uh, you know, we were looking at offshore wind on the East Coast, and, and that project was not approved. We look at uh, landfills, who wants landfills, who wants incinerators, who wants wind farms, who wants big solar utility. So I, I think that there's always going to be resistance, so we have to... Um, we have to think smart about, and I think about policy, about we have to think about the technologies we tap into um, to satiate our energy needs and the consequences that come with those, with an open mind. And we, we have to try to minimize those consequences. But development is always a question of give and take. And uh, maybe here I, I have some renewable projects maybe I'll talk about. I have favorites and, and ones that I, I, I'm not as, as comfortable with. Just because it's a renewable project doesn't mean it shouldn't be challenged on, on, an, on uh, and, and I'll have some examples of that. So, <clears throat> but I do want to maybe touch on a couple of the object objections that we commonly hear. 
you hear often that um, renewables are fluctuating, so we can't really use them, right? They're, you know, the wind may not always be blowing, the sun may not always be shining, so we can't use them. But I, you look at the, the, the agriculture, agriculture is, an, is maybe another energy sector, right? It's, we have, have developed an agriculture sector in energy that feeds 7 billion people a year we know how to distribute those energy supplies globally, and we know how to store those energy supplies. So if we don't think we can solve that for our other energy sectors, I think that's more resistance than a, than a, a real objection. So, as, and it's just put it in equivalent terms, I added up the calories of, of food we consume annually, and, and it's 3 million tons of coal equivalent a day in food uh, supplies. All right, so um, I, I put this up because this is an example of a 24-hour window. You can go to California Independent Systems Operators website, and it's really a, a neat place to go and look at through the season. But they show you what was the energy production during the day uh, from the variety of sources. So these are their renewable sources. And, and first I'll point out down at the bottom that you've got their kind of their, their um, <clears throat> baseline resources, um, uh, you've got their geothermal, biomass, biogas, and small hydro. Small hydro has seasonal fluctuations. But what you'll see there is where wind and, and solar are complementing each other, as I talked about in Germany. So here you have wind, and then you have this big hunk of solar that rolls in, in in the middle of the day, and then the wind stirs in the evening. So you look at this and you say, if I'm the power sector, I'm the consumer, how do I contend with this? Now I've got energy that's being supplied by nature, and, and then I have my demand side. And, and I, 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 I talked about this mo moment ago. It, we have, with fossil fuels, developed a demand-oriented grid where when we want something, we turn on a light switch, and, and, and the grid delivers that. <clears throat> and I think now um, nature is going to determine what she's going to serve up to us. We'll have storage technologies, but the most efficient use of, of, of the energy is if you use it directly. And I think what we're going to see is smarter grids and smarter devices that will take the, the highs and lows off of this production and, um, and, and we'll do just fine. It's, a, it's different, but it's not a big leap. And we have the technologies and we'll do just fine. So we're not going to, the idea, if we go to win, we're not going to be sitting in the dark in the, in, in the middle of the day and, and uh, powers go off here in the Stegner Center. So um, <clears throat> the, I, I think it's also important to think about where fuels are concentrated, uh, solar is, insulation is diffuse. Where um, fuels are forms of stored energy, solar radiation is indulating daily between on and off. Um, so these are different, uh, but solar is, is, is very much uh, predictable and sustainable. And uh, when I think about some of, when I look at some of the projects that we see around the world, I feel like we're making some mistakes uh, and, and <clears throat> where when we implement large solar PV utilities, we're concentrating something that's diffuse, that's naturally diffuse, and it feels like we're kind of mimicking our fossil fuel model, centralizing it. And it seems like it's a little bit of inertia. We're doing what we've done, but we're doing it with a different energy source. But, but uh, renewables have uh, a magnitude last um, power density. So I, I think we'd be wise if we'd look to harvest our solar in places that we've already developed. And, and I, I kind of put this graphic up there. This is Ivan Paul down in the Mojave Desert, 3,500 acres collecting solar thermal energy. This is not one of my favorite projects, um, and it probably ranks up there with one of my least favorite projects. Yes, it's renewable, but it's a bad idea uh, in the long run. Um, I, I'd like, it, it, and, and we'll see how it develops in the years ahead, but uh, there was a company called Colas. Um, there is a company called Colas, and they're a large, uh, global, uh, vertically integrated company that has materials and construction equipment for roadways, and, and they took it upon themselves to say, geez, we should be harvesting um, uh, solar energy on our roads, and, and they are at the beginning stages of building what France uh, hopes to be a 1,000-kilometer 
uh, what way they call it, look it up. So it's early stages, but you know, the challenge there is it won't be as efficient. Uh, there may be maintenance issues, but you know, it's, it's new technologies, it's trying to prove itself. What I like about it is it's using existing spaces uh, instead of continuing to encroach, you know, continuing to, you know, I was down with Kate Cannon, she says, I'm not aware of any, once we build a road, we never take it down. So I think that something we should think about. Um, I also, <clears throat> you, you hear pushback in, in, with renewables in terms of efficiencies, and, and I'll start off with our fossil fuels uh, were, were um, converted from biomass or, or animals that fed upon plants, uh, likely with a conversion rate of 2%, and when we convert those to electricity at, at best 50%, I could make the strong case that fossil fuels are less than 1% efficient. So when you show me a solar PV panel that's 25% efficient, I'm not unconcerned with that. I'm like, that's fantastic. Um, so I think what we're seeing now um, is there's two parts to the way we attack the problem of our dependence on fossil fuels. You're going to look for alternatives, but we're going to rein in a rapacious use of, 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 of energy through both conservation and efficiency programs. And the, the energy field is a little bit like origami. Every time you change a form, there's a leak. And uh, a coal plant manages uh, three conversions. So I think we're going to see some innovation in, in uh, innovation. So um, I've got the five-minute signal here, so I'm going to have to move quickly here. I'm going to go through. This, this is intended to be rapid fire. Bloomberg Financial Energy New Finance. Um, great place to look at. So here's a couple highlights of technology. So when we think of the temporal nature of renewables, uh, we have wind that isn't always generating when we need it or generating above what the demand is at a given time. And Germany has just put in a electrolysis plant. I think it's six or eight megawatt. Um, so it's a six megawatt electrolyzer. So they've got this wind farm. And when it's producing electricity above demand, they divert the electricity. It it does electrolysis, it creates the hydrogen. And you can see their model. That hydrogen then would be delivered into a tanker. They're, they are creating a thousand, from this plant, a thousand um, hydrogen stations for fuel, fuel cell cars. Uh, they can pump that hydrogen into a gas line and use it much like we use um, um, natural gas. And that same hydrogen could be reused downstream uh, to regenerate electricity. So there's an innovation. I think uh, Japan has been playing around this for decades, and I think it's an interesting version of a micro combined heat and power. And we talk about centralized power. What they do is in your home, you'll have an appliance like your heat pump. It generates electricity on demand, and the energy that is lost during that conversion, thermal energy, is used for hot water and heating applications. And in some instances, they're saying they're close to 90% efficient in the use of energy. So I think that's a something to follow, but it, it gives you a clue of kind of where the world and where the innovators are looking. In South Korea, they've dedicated an entire island, Jeju Island, and they're testing out all these technologies, the storage, the smart grids, the renewable technologies, and uh, their intention is to kind of fine tune this, and then they hope to have um, uh, attack the uh, smart grid uh, and device market as an export technology. Um, so these are some of the projects that have just been announced. If you look at Chile, um, this is unsubsidized. This is purchase price for the production, 2.91 cents for solar kilowatt hour. Unbelievable. You look at 3.6% in, in Mexico. You've got um, uh, the Golden Triangle in India, 4.2, 3 cents in, in Dubai. Uh, we talk about wind projects. Uh, we're at 5.4 cents. Um, these are offshore prices. Um, and then onshore, three cents per kilowatt hour. Offshore was forecasting 10 cents by 2020. We're already there. It goes back to my point. When things move, they move faster. Um, this is a, maybe a telltale sign. Renew, Renewable 21 uh, publication uh, shows you in the last since 2012, this is the investment in the power sector in renewables as opposed to fossil fuels. And you can see that flattening out. Um, and uh, so that's good news, and which is saying that around the world, the economic tipping point has arrived, and the answer is not a, a, 
a fossil fuel power plant, even combined cycle, the answer is renewables. <coughs> um, here's some Germany's goals. Uh, there will be challenges, but they're out front. They want by 2050, 80% of their power sector to be uh, renewables, 2050. 60% um, of their primary energy. Um, and they, they want to cut their consumption through conservation and efficiency by 50% by 2050. That's probably the most challenging and impressive to me. Um, and Denmark, a little bit of a moon landing goal. By 2050, they want to be done across all sectors. Um, down at the, the graphic shows how they've decentralized power. This is a picture in 1985 and 19, 2009 shows you how they've distributed the generation of electricity. There's a different model that they are implementing. Um, these are some share of renewable energy in final energy. Um, Finland, 39, Latvia, um, Slovenia, 54. These are already exceeding 2020 goals. Um, I've talked about the U.S. You know, um, I think we have a measured approach. I think we, we spend over $600 billion in military. We, we seem to think three and four platforms ahead. Uh, we're uh, concerned with... Um, obsolescence, but we, we don't seem to take a very far look into it. When you look at the platforms of presidential candidates since 1992, boy, what a whipsaw we got going on here. We'd love to have a steady hand. Um, so uh, I, I do believe that states and municipalities will lead the way in the U.S., fortunately. Um, uh, here's some of the renewable portfolio. Aspen, first municipality, 100%. You've got Maine at 40%. Hawaii, 100%. They're going to do geothermal and wind primarily. California, very progressive, 50%. Um, <clears throat> running out of time, but I do want to say, you know, with the policy conundrum, I, I, I think that, that it's important to say what is the problem. In this room, I, I, I wonder what diversity we would have if I ask, you know, what's the problem that we're solving when we're building our energy plan? So I think it's important to maybe say, you know, are we avoiding the consequences of climate change, poor air quality? eliminate our dependence on fossil fuels, um, it's not sustainable. You know, what is the problem or problems? And I think policy closely behind that. I also uh, think policy uh, would benefit with a longer view. And uh, I think we have to see both sides of it. Uh, we have to be concerned with both sides of it. So when there's winners and losers, if you will, we need to be thinking about retraining those, those localities that are going to be hard hit through a transition and find, help find new jobs, train those folks up. Uh, and that, that's part of a comprehensive solution. I do have a favorite um, that, um, uh, you know, I'll just talk about briefly. I, I, we make many of our decisions on economic terms, and I believe our economic lens is broken. I think this, this report, Hidden Costs of Energy, Unpriced Consequences, is a seminal study that came out, and, and, and uh, there are others. And I think that they're, they're, those are large dollars. They're directly traceable, and they're not integrated into our economics. And when we don't integrate them, we make uh, flawed decisions. And if we did integrate it, um, our, our uh, tipping point would occur um, faster. So I, I, I'm a big fan of a carbon tax. Uh, our friends up here in BC were the first ones in North America to implement it. This may be very, very difficult to implement. I understand. I'm not naive, but sometimes you have to put on paper what you want and then go from there. But I believe the carbon tax gets the economics of uh, fossil fuel supplies and allows renewables to compete on, on, on their merits. I also believe it's important part of the health and environment. If we believe climate is undermined and health is undermined, then, then I think we should uh, put a figure on that. And, and, and if, if carbon tax can attack those four categories of forces, it only speeds up the natural interest countries have around the world in moving to clean, sustainable supplies of energy. And then I do want to say power of price. Price, the U.S. has a prior, has, places a premium on low cost prices at the pump and at our electric meters. And I think that also inhibits our forward progress. And I'll look at the power of price. You've got Norway um, at one end and you've got Venezuela at eight cents uh, per gallon. And you've got cross-border cross smuggling in Venezuela and you've got in Norway uh, fossil fuel rich. There are periods where they're selling more electric cars than internal combustion engines today. So price is 
is a choice. Cost is somewhat avoidable, uh, unavoidable, but price is a choice and you can do. So carbon tax, I think, can help uh, drive conservation efficiency and it, it can certainly take us to the future. Um, same thing with electricity. Um, we have low cost electricity in both residential and industrial and higher costs are um, um, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it certainly drives the quality of life in Germany is not very different than in the U.S. I've certainly traveled and very comfortable one in Germany. So, um, and then I, I, I think as I'm bringing it to a close, if I had to peer and say, where are we on the life cycle? I would say the thermal neutron, I didn't talk about nuclear. That's a whole another subject. All of our plants are thermal neutron. Um, uh, I think they're in their decline phase. I think there may be investment. Uh, there's certainly investment outside the U.S., certainly in fusion. That's a long way off but fast re generation four fast reactors, but thermal neutron is on its decline. I think large hydro is going about as far as we can go. Coal is right there. I think we're going to start to see that retract globally, even though there are projections for it to continue to grow. I think they're not going to be realized. I think petroleum is not far behind. The last really fossil fuel standing will be natural gas. I think of the renewables. Onshore is already starting to see rapid pickup. Solar PV right behind it. Offshore coming very close. And then the fast reactor, I put that in as <clears throat> on a global basis. Um, uh, Russia, for instance, has already fired up a uh, 800 megawatt fast reactor. And by the way, that uses the spent fuel stockpiles. Um, um, so we, we, the advantage of that is you wouldn't have to guard these stockpiles for eternity and you're using those as an energy source. So, I mean, the last word, uh, many of the vulnerable company, uh, countries will be uh, um, will rapidly displace, and I think the, the, the fortunate become the vulnerable. Um, by certainly mid-century, uh, power and transportation will be, the leading share will be sourced by renewables. Um, oil and gas suppliers with low costs are gonna hold those positions, but they're still gonna have economic hardships. When I think about um, policy, I think there are folks around the world where, you know, you know, there, there could be disorder if, if we don't manage this transition well. Um, high cost real reserves, I believe, will, there's, may never be extracted and calling them a reserves is creating some financial exposure. Micro CHP that I talked about, I think will be as common as a heat pump um, that we see today. And I believe later this century, we'll develop systems around hydrogen as a, a new age fuel and then Early adopter nations will establish market positions. I use like uh, wind turbines. Of the top 10 wind turbine manufacturers in the world, four of them are from China, three from Germany, one from Spain, one from Denmark, and thank God we got GE in there. Thank you very much. So last word, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Could you hit the mic, please? Stand up. And... Really loud, but oh, that's, the, yeah, you that's are. Okay. Um, can you elaborate on why the solar panels in California are your least favorite project? Yeah, I, I well, I, I think the first thing is 3,500 acres, and it goes back to my, my hope is that uh, we're not mindlessly imitating a centralized paradigm, um, and uh, uh, that that. Um, Solar energy is diffuse, and I would love to see us collect it where we've already developed. The other thing is it's, it's concentrated solar. It's not PV, and it's, it's, it's a high-cost renewable relative to the others. And today, around the world, I think we've added, um, I would say, solar PV as a technology is getting 90% of the investment over concentrated solar. So I think many other people have identified it as a less attractive solar technology. There are, there are better solutions, both environmentally and cost. Mm -hmm. This gentleman here, and I'll get you. I, uh, I like your point about the carbon tax, but if there were a carbon tax, what would be the best tools that were currently in Germany? Yeah, I, I believe. So the, the question was, uh, agreement with the idea of a carbon tax, but, but what would you do with the funds from the carbon tax? And I, I would like to also maybe qualify the nice, the, the attractive part of a carbon tax is as we transition, 
it's a transient tax, so it's not permanently in place. And I would use it to fund the transition. It funds, it could be retraining uh, in, in localities hard hit. It could be infrastructure. We talk about infrastructure programs. We do need to upgrade our grids. We do, do need storage technologies, complementary technology. So I would invest it in the infrastructure to see us through this transition to temporal energy sources. Okay, you had a question? I just think we have to, to get on with it. So answer the question. So uh, question was, to what extent, given that these renewables are temporal, to what extent is energy storage a barrier to really making the move? I, I believe it is. Uh, when you get above 20% uh, contribution from your renewables, uh, that's starting to ha get to a point where you have to complement that with storage and smart technologies. So we're going to see th those countries that have hit that, are all, that's why Germany is so important, they've crossed that 20%. We're, we're nowhere near that. Um, they've crossed that 20%, and that's why I think that hydrogen plant, I shared that with you. I think we're going to see more solutions. Certainly we're going to see a lot of batteries. <laughs> But I also think hydrogen is, go is going to emerge as a, uh, you know, the, the, the round trip efficiency of batteries is 90 plus percent. The round trip efficiency of hydrogen is 40 or 50 percent. So th the challenge with hydrogen is you're going to have to use, bring that back through a combined heat and power. That's why I believe that's also important because then your round trip efficiency can get back up to where batteries are. So I think of hydrogen as very, very long term. And I think of batteries are, are things that are, give us new ways in which we can manage the load on the grid in a kind of a 24, 48 hour window. But I think we'll have other long-term supplies and I don't see them as inhibitors to the transition. And every day, if you look at technologies coming out of Cambridge and you see them out of China, we're developing uh, batteries with five times the density of the current lithium batteries. So, that's a huge market, and there's a lot of businesses <laughs> jumping into that space, and you're seeing some very interesting news coming out of there. So I think it is a, a tremendous opportunity, business opportunity, and I think it's just a question of investing in that kind of inf infrastructure and setting these renewable portfolios are great at this stage for initiating, but now we need to have standards, goals that we set around storage. How much storage do we need? Um, where do we need it? So I, I think we have to set goals across all the sectors. Okay, sorry, gotcha, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation and book. My pleasure. It's very hopeful. I share your optimism. I think innovation is undeniable. We look at Kodak film, uh, blockbuster video, they're all gone. Um, but because we have so much fossil fuel in this country, uh, we tend to have it being used as a wedge issues in our in our politics and we can plainly see that going on right now we want to go back to coal uh, apparently um how is is that slowing us down perceptibly is it two steps forward and one step back or the other way around uh, you know I, I do think it's from my personal perspective i think it's harmful to, to go into locations and, and uh, suggest that we're bringing these jobs back i, I don't know how that's going to happen um um, it's, it's, it would be more interesting um, to take a broader look. I also think sometimes we, we, folks lead on climate change and, you know, not climate change, and we, you see these vicious fights uh, around that. And I think if we broaden the conversation a bit, and there's no denying that environment and climate, and by the way, I'm very concerned with, with climate change personally, but not everybody shares my, my belief. But I think if we broaden the conversation around, this is inevitable, right? It's like pulling a Band-Aid, right? You can do it slow and it's painful, but you just whip that off. And I, so I think transitions, you, you just have to peer into the future, see where you're going and then go there and then try to manage both sides. I think it's important to see both sides. 
I mean, I, I uh, think if, if I'm a community and I'm depending upon uh, the fossil fuels, it would be nice to have uh, a policy that comes in and helps my community <laughs> with the transition. So I don't, that's all I can say, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I would set, you know, yeah, so I, I, going back to, you know, my optimism at state and municipalities that, that move, and it may not be at a federal level, and why am I enthusiastic? I, I guess I'm enthusiastic when I see, um, you know, California, and, and very thoughtful policy, very clearly stated goals. You know, I would say, so when I see that, and, and, it, and it represents, I think of values change. You know, in, in a given room, I can have a, around the world and, and, and with different audiences, values shift a little bit. And I think to some extent, those four forces represent a little bit of value, particularly when you think of climate and environment and custodianship and sustainability. Not every, it doesn't register with everybody the same. So I think you find localities that are more tuned into that. Yeah, yeah, and I have good friends in West Virginia, you know, so I, the, but I, I, I do, and I think it could be more job related um, in the perspective, and that's why I use that country. It's hard for folks to walk away. Inertia is an amazing force, right? And, and someone asked me a question the other day, why did I write this book? And, and my first answer was I wanted to impress my daughter over there, but, <laughs> but I only say, but I, I wrote it because I, I'm really concerned that inertia is a very powerful force. And I think that we, we've got too narrow in of a view of this energy sector in the U.S. And I think that if you peer a little bit further and you peer, peer wide, it seems the signposts are pretty loud and clear. And I think there's consequences, economic and environment, by delaying that move. And so if you say, why did I write the book? That's, that's why. And I, I get hope when I see small municipalities like Aspen, because I think that's where it starts. And then they're going to be successful. And often leaders, it, it starts with leadership, right? And then, then you get fast following. And that's just the way a lot of markets move. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I loved it. Um, the a report was released earlier uh, this year that says the World Bank's development plan for a lot of least developed countries and developing countries focuses on the development of fossil fuel centered uh, energy grids. And given that we have two billion people who live um, at a certain percentage of, um, glo of energy poverty, um, as industrialization sort of brings them forward in terms of the energy grid, do you think we're going to see a renewed uh, demand for fossil fuel, given that their uh, energy infrastructure will be centered around fossil fuel. Um, I'm not, what's that report just that? Uh, it was a report uh, put out January this year. I want to say it was released through a consumer watchdog NGO. Um, I can't remember the exact organization off the top of my head, sorry. Yeah, I, I'd be surprised. I, I want to go take a look at that report. Uh, you know, when I think of, um, uh, w when I was doing the research, I was startled. I was putting things in context and I was looking at got one billion people out of seven billion that don't have access to electricity. And you're seeing projects in many of those places that are renewable as the, their first touch to electricity. So that's hard to, uh, to imagine. I want to go read that part. And, it, and when you look at Germany, there's more capacity in the power sector in Germany than all of sub-Saharan Africa. So I think there's an opportunity for renewables. Now, fossil fuels have had many many a year and decade to, to help. And you kind of, the path has not solved the problem. I think renewables are going to be the solution.
No, that, it, that has not been. Um, so the question was, did I um, include in external costs in the figures that I presented here? No, I did not. And I believe that um, a carbon tax of about uh, $50 a ton would start to get there. And if I calculated what I, what I um, would hold as uh, traceable costs, uh, a, a carbon tax of 130 would be a fair. So if we started at 50 politically, uh, it starts to, to get us there. And I, I also point out that 400 firms around the world are already using a carbon tax to make some of their decisions from Google, Amazon, everybody's already, they're way out ahead of it. So we, it, it's a, it's not a real tax, but they're saying sooner or later, we're going to tax this and they're putting a tax and they're using that in their financial models to make decisions. Okay. All righty. Thank you very much. Uh, for the next Signer Center event. Thank you.